Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. The subject of of my talk tonight is uh, is non-dualism, and but it's a, it's got a particular set of subjects that uh, will fit into that, and it's starting out with the uh, great meeting of uh, Vimala Kirti and Mandrusri uh, and the many bodhisattvas who came to visit uh, in a great uh, meeting of the bodhisattvas as recorded in the Vimala Kirti Sutra. And the crux of that is that the Mandrusri asks all the bodhisattvas to give their particular take on the transcendence of, uh, of duality and their entry into non-duality. And they give various answers about how they went beyond the opposites or the conflicts of apparent existence to enter into non-dual awareness. One of them said that they had transcended the duality between happiness and misery. Another said that they had gone beyond the seeming contradiction between the pure and the impure. And that may seem like one that's particular to monks, but we all have our own uh, thoughts and beliefs about what is pure and impure, what is good and bad, uh, what is okay and not okay, um, which is probably a translation in the sutra from Kusala and Ekusala, which can be translated in a few different ways, uh, sometimes translated as uh, wholesome and unwholesome, and sometimes translated as skillful and unskillful, um, which in Buddhism have related meanings. meanings. And those, those kinds of conflicts apply to all of us, and the bodhisattvas were happily announcing how they had gone beyond those to a more uh, balanced and non-dual state. They even mentioned going beyond the duality between self and non-self, which is a favorite topic in Zen. Manjushri thinks these accounts are all uh, very noteworthy and fine, but he notes that they are still acknowledging the dualistic reality. If we have to refer to the pairs of opposites to be transcended, we're still in a dualistic frame of mind. So then Manjushri gets around to asking the great Vimala Kirti to give his take on the way of entering into non-duality, and Vimala Kirti sits there absolutely silent. Uh, this is often called, uh, noted as Vimala Kirti's thunderous silence, and he's um, honored for his response instead of trying to come up with various opposites and talk about going past them, he doesn't acknowledge them at all. And he demonstrates the non-dual reality by just being present. Manjushri declares that this answer alone clearly demonstrates the entry into non-duality. The only non-dual point of view um, is to make no statement at all. And you can extrapolate that to mean that there's conceptual idea of non-duality or duality to turn into another pair of opposites and create another duality. If you say there's non-duality versus duality, then you've turned non-duality into a pair in opposition to dualism. It's kind of difficult to avoid this trap, and Vimala Kirti's thunderous silence is seen as a great solution. And the idea of entering into non-dual silence uh, is pretty popular and has been taken pretty seriously in a number of different ways. Um, we hear a lot about how in, in Zen and perhaps in the meditative community in general that silence is better than speech and that only silence is, is really uh, completely pure and representing, representing uh, a non-dual or a transcendent uh, 
uh, type of state of being. And in the past, monks of all kinds were prone to take vows of silence, uh, enter into silence, and of course, we uh, have long silent retreats in Zen. And so even today, we find great value in silent meditation retreats. Um, and there's certainly a lot of value in letting the mind reach a place of stillness where conceptual distinctions fall away, where we can enter into a deeper state of balance and samadhi and experience the moment with a more expansive and open mind without cutting it up into conceptual pieces. Some schools are based on this kind of silent meditation and Japanese Soto Zen is one of them. Its predecessor in China was even called the Silent Illumination School. And one can indeed often move into deeper samadhi in meditation by practicing inner and outer silence. But problems can also arise from thinking that silence is the one vehicle of non-dual awareness. For one thing, it's been noted that those who practice silent meditation sometimes have a hard time transitioning from the non-dual silence of meditation into non-dual awareness when they leave the cushion and enter back into the apparently very dualistic world. And for lay practitioners, this is an even greater challenge. Uh, when the sink is leaking and the spouse is yelling at you to stop watching TV, it's hard to maintain non-dual awareness and transcend the opposites. Good and bad often seem like choices that are right in our faces and we have to decide which way to go. It's also difficult to communicate without speaking. And so uh, for lay people uh, and even for monks when they, you know, have their many moments of communication when they're not meditating, um, you know, they have to talk. So the uh, Vimalakirti's answer to non-dualism to stay in silence works up to a point and it certainly demonstrates something. But, um, you know, if the person that you're dealing with says, do you want to have, uh, are you ready for dinner? And the other person doesn't say anything, it will eventually get annoying. Um, and even the monks who vowed silence you know, would kind of get around it by writing messages on slips of paper and handing them to people, which when you really get down to it is just another way of talking. So, in the world of talk and communication, of action and response that we live in, being silent so that everything remains really non-dual it doesn't really work, at least off the cushion. So we need a transitional way of navigating from non-duality to the dualistic world while still maintaining a non-dual understanding. I'd like to simplify this for a moment by saying that my favorite way of resolving this issue, with all due respect to Vimala Kerti, who had much deeper understanding than I do, uh, is to see the non-dual in the dual. If we keep trying to enter a special state of non-dual consciousness, we'll always be in conflict with the apparent reality that we live in from day to day and from moment to moment. And this may be a very lay, uh, lay person's view, but um, still in the world has some validity. So why not just give up and give in? Um, in any case, how we view the ups and downs of this constantly changing world of samsara that we are part of can make a big difference. And it's not dependent on Vimala Kerti's roaring silence, as it is known. What about, what about embracing the roar of the world as well? And here's one way to talk about that view of duality and why it is non-dual in a rather concrete way. We seem to be in a world of separate named objects, the products of what is called name and form. And that we as individuals running around in this world are separate from it as well. 
And one of the goals of Zen is to, in a way, dissolve that sense of separation. But it's not, uh, not always easy. If we maintain the understanding that everything is connected and that everything we appear to do is a product of mutually arising conditions and actions, we can more easily maintain the view that we're not independent organisms in a world of independent objects, but that we are in a unified field of conditions and events of which we are part. Some simple ways of experimenting with this idea are with physical existence and functions. The air we breathe from moment to moment and which keeps our bodies alive is the same air that's breathed by everyone else. I hope that doesn't make you feel claustrophobic. Including animals and aerobic bacteria. Anaerobic bacteria have their own method of respiration, which we will not deal with today. But a lot of organisms are included. Trees breathe in our carbon dioxide which they need to live, and we breathe in the oxygen, which is a byproduct of their outbreath, so to speak. There's a deep symbiosis in our very means of life in that way. And Native Americans, for one, uh, have this sense of connectivity and interdependence at the center of their way of life. And as hunters and gatherers, they would always treat the animals and plants in their environment with great respect and a sense of equality, which in our Western existence in modern days, we don't often have, and we don't really always maintain that kind of awareness. So there's not only physical interdependence, but by extension, relational interdependence. We participate in a cycle of life that includes both us and everything around us. By further extension, we're part of an interconnected web of human relationships that extend around the globe through our actions and those of others and how we regard and treat each other. And our planet is part, to quickly skip over that whole social relation thing, our planet is part of a system of galaxies that all behave together according to laws and forces that they have in common and that we experience every time we drop something and it hits the ground due to gravity and weight. This view of a thoroughly interconnected and interdependent world and universe can give us a sense of how the seemingly dualistic universe of separate objects and beings is really one unified whole that operates in sync like a well-oiled machine. Another way of approaching a non-dual approach to life and reality, or approaching an approach, I like that, is the Zen idea of embodiment. And that's a really nice one that some disciplines have, but many do not. Um, embodiment has at least two really useful and somewhat practical aspects to it, as well as taking on a non-dual way of being. One of these is really pretty simple, which is to include the awareness of the body in what we are doing. And this has the secondary salutary effect of unifying the body in whatever action you are taking. One aspect of duality is the separation of mind and body in a very concrete sense. We tend to be involved with our thoughts, often conceptual ones that try to figure out or define a situation. And meanwhile, our physical organism is doing this or that, but is unattended with direct awareness. Uh, it reminds me of uh, today's moms and nannies and some dads who are walking along with their baby carriage while talking on the cell phone and the baby might as well not be there. <laughs> They're just going for the ride. And we, do the, we take the same approach with our bodies to a certain extent, uh, and we try to correct this to some extent in Zen. But a lot of times we're busy talking and thinking and doing this and that, and we don't have a lot of physical awareness. Um, so in the embodied approach, we keep full awareness of the body in whatever we're doing. Our thoughts are not separated out into another region of our attention and can even slow or subside. And our body and physical task also become unified and our thoughts become more closely aligned with our physical action. So if I'm loading the trunk of a car, instead of thinking about where I'm going and how late I am, 
my attention may be refocused on this item in the trunk with unified attention and thought not only on the object but on the body doing the lifting and the seamless coming together of the body object and trunk as one uh, one action so that all become unified parts of the task at hand this also unifies me with the moment and embodies the moment because I'm fully occupying the present situation instead of being, so to speak, somewhere else. And this also is a great meditation. So it serves the physical action and it serves the sense of the body and the mind being unified and being uh, harmonized with the task so that I don't feel disconnection and discomfort with what I'm doing but it also creates a meditation out of whatever I'm doing because I'm being present and as fully aware as possible. Um, it allows physical activities to be done with much greater ease and skill. When I'm present and aware of the unified physical moment, I can even also take more skillful and appropriate action. And this, of course, also applies to non-object oriented activities, such as communicating with another person or a movement or action in response to an active situation. The martial arts, yoga, and zazen itself bring greater awareness to the body in action and create a unifying discipline between mind, body, and objects of activity. Uh, for instance, if you're practicing Tai Chi, as I have done in the past, there's a sense of coming from the earth and having a unified, connected, uh, physical awareness going all the way through the body and to the action is one unified piece. And other, other martial arts, yoga and zazen, also have that sense of being aware of the physicality of the body and the involvement in action. Um, and this can also be done as a practice in its own right, whether washing the dishes or having a conversation. So again, it's, a, it's taking a form of unified meditation and bringing it into everyday action. There's also embodiment in a related sense in koan practice, kungan, koan, um, the Zen story situations or problems which students are given who engage in koan meditation, where one embodies or takes on the life and physicality of the Zen koan, the situation of the koan or the key part of the koan, and demonstrates or represents it through physical form or action. This is also a great practice. Um, there are many stories of Zen monks spontaneous response in word or action that accorded with the moment like call and response, picking up a person to carry them across the river, kicking over the stove, uh, leaving the room with sandals on your head, very exciting uh, theatrical spontaneous actions that physically embodied the moment. Awareness of embodiment and the physical situation we each engage with is also handled as one might expect in the original talks of the Buddha. And he takes care of the very basic level of this in the Sutta on the full awareness of the body. I was trying to remember the name of this Sutta and I think I kind of strung it together from Pali, but I may have it mixed up. It's something like the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta. Basically, it's the full awareness of, of the physical body. Uh, Buddha advises us to be aware of our body position in every aspect of life. And this keeps us aware of the body and in embodied orientation, whether eating, lying down, walking, going to the bathroom, all of our everyday activities. And you might say, hey, I know where my body is, okay? I, you know, I follow it pretty closely wherever I go. I know when I'm sitting down and I know when I'm standing up. These instructions from the Buddha are kind of redundant. But if you really pay close attention, you know, if somebody asks you, are you sitting or standing? Sure, you can answer them accurately. But are you really aware that you're sitting or are you really aware that you're standing? It's actually a little more subtle uh, than it seems. So it's, and it's a really nice sutta if you get a chance to take a look at it. Uh, one of the ultimate non-dual and non-separate self-talks of the Buddha, non-dual yeah, non and non-separate self-talks, and I, I, I put that together, uh, but I'm not sure what it means, of the Buddha 
applies this principle to our experiencing capacity, our perception and thinking, are we, uh, where is our awareness? And this is kind of skipping uh, to another perspective, but it's basically that when you are one with your action, you don't have a separate self. And uh, the Buddha makes this very clear in the Bahaya Sutta, uh, where the Buddha advises this as a way to liberation. And he says, quoting, then Bahaya, you should train yourself thus. In reference to the scene, there will be only the scene. In reference to the herd, only the herd. In reference to the sensed, only the sense. And he even adds, in reference to the cognized, only the cognized, in case you thought that thinking is not allowed. Um, but if you're really thinking when you're thinking, and you're unified with it, you're okay. That is how you should train yourself, he says. When for you, there will be only the seen in reference to the seen, only the heard in reference to the heard, only the sensed in reference to the, sen to the, to the sensed, only the cognized in reference to the cognized, then Baha'i, there is no you in connection with that. When there is no you in connection with that, there is no you there. When there is no you there, you are neither here nor yonder, nor yonder, nor between the two. This, just this, is the end of stress. So when we are in an embodied and unified mode and we're not separating from what we're doing, and establishing a separate self that's not quite happy with what we're doing or that's trying to do it differently or that wants to do something else or that's thinking about what they're doing, then we have, a, we have achieved a unified non-dual state where the self does not separate out. When we embrace the full richness of the present moment without the sense of a separate self in this way, we are in the ultimate and fully embodied non-dual orientation, whether we are silent or doing a lot of talking. Um, but are we once again stuck in having to choose a specialized state to embody the non-dual standpoint? You know, we have to make believe that we're very embodied or else we're going to be non-dual again. I mean, unless we're going to be dualistic again. It's kind of an interesting trap. So what do we do when the sense of separation of a separate self arises? And th that does not apply to all of you who no longer have a separate self arise, which is great. Um, we surely do not want to make believe that it's not there, which is also kind of a fun uh, practice of saying, I no longer have a separate self. I got rid of that a long time ago. Uh, or declare defeat against non-dualism. Uh, when we find ourselves in a dualistic state and say, well, I can't do it. Even if we have a strong non-dual awakening like Baha'i, who fully awakened from the Buddha's lesson in the non-self reality, the reality beyond separation. What happens when Baha'i stubs his toe or he has to wash the dishes? Does the separate self pop back up to have to transition or to try to do something? The practice is to fully embody and be unified with what you're doing, but sometimes the feeling arises, I really don't feel like doing the dishes, even while I'm doing them. And there's a sense of the self separating from the task. So what do we do? Since we can assume that we'll be practicing for the rest of our lives and maybe even after, we can't wait until all sense of separation has gone away forever. And it's very possible that such a permanent state doesn't exist. Certainly not while we're still in a samsaric body mind in the world of changes and challenges. Once again, my solution is to understand that duality is also non-dual. And it goes along with the Heart Sutra saying that, uh, you know, form, form is emptiness, emptiness is, in some translations, uh, no other or nothing other than form. So it's in form, uh, in apparent form, that we recognize emptiness and non-duality. When we feel separate, even the feeling of separation is just an arising thought or sensation within the unified whole of life. And instead of trying to change it, we can embrace it, unify with it, work with it, and make it part of our practice and realize its nature as part of the magnificent whole 
which has been called one mind, big mind, Buddha mind, original mind, primordial consciousness, the unborn or the unconditioned, among other terms to point at it. Whatever arises, no matter how dualistic and separational it may seem, even if you are upset, uncool, and at odds with reality, you have the option of opening your arms and embracing it as the messenger of the unified reality of Buddha nature, the Dharmakaya body of reality, and make it your own. If we say yes to whatever we encounter, we defeat uh, dualism by doing so. And we become the happy warrior for non-duality. And just as a side note, when you embrace something and become one with it, it's actually easier to change it if that's what's required. But that might be a talk for another time with its own complexities. Bodhidharma said that working with adversity was the heart of Zen. And Zen Master Jesus said to love your enemy. Uh, Huang Bo said, I will let go with both hands. Difficult teachings for another time. Sometimes the teachings on non-dualism can be dualistic. They teach that to realize the unified non-dual reality, we have to change our perspective, and if we don't, we're stuck in dualism. And I like to take this extra step and say that even if you're stuck in dualism, you can acknowledge that the actual reality is non-dual and that there's just a thought or feeling of non-dualism within of dualism within the non-dual reality in which we are all interconnected rather than an actual separative state. Duality is an aspect of non-duality. I am me and you are you and yet at the same time we're both part of a larger reality that is seamlessly interconnected. Go out beyond separate bodies and see us as part of the planet. Go out beyond the planet and see us as part of the solar system and then galaxy. Go out beyond the galaxies and see us as part of the universe, a unified whole. Go out beyond the universe and see the empty living space that is the body of everything. And you are here, you're both right here as yourself and part of the unbroken whole. And as Leonardo da Vinci put it in his famous painting, and to uh, to demonstrate this silently as Vimalakirti would approve of, 